Hello everybody, welcome to the entire ocean mystery iceberg. I wanted to make this series because I thought the ocean was just really cool, and honestly, the depths of the ocean is such a terrifying thing. I mean, when you think about almost the entire Earth being covered by this mass of water that just gets so deep that we absolutely cannot survive in it, just all the undiscovered places in the ocean and undiscovered species in the ocean, it's kind of overwhelming, and so... I made a chart of all of the most weird, most obscure, and mysterious things about the ocean, like situations, animals, ideas, and that's what is the ocean mystery iceberg. Like on the top, there's more known things like Atlantis, the Bermuda Triangle, and like the Bloop. And as you get further down, there's more obscure things like that one mermaid documentary, the Ningen, Phantom Island Bermeja, where do eels come from, nobody knows. But if you like mysteries and you're terrified of the ocean, then you should watch this video and consider subscribing because we're going to be doing more weird stuff just like this. I hope you like it. Tell me what you think in the comments at the end or right now. Let's get into it. The ocean is massive. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by salt water. Despite its size and the impact on our lives, the ocean remains a mystery. More than 80% of the ocean has never been mapped, explored, or even seen by humans. A far greater percentage of the surfaces of the Moon and Mars have been mapped and studied than our own ocean floor. NASA's budget far exceeds the budget of the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the reason for that is that the ocean at great depths is characterized by zero visibility and extreme cold temperatures, and crushing amounts of pressure. This makes it extremely difficult and expensive to build vehicles that are fit to go in such areas. The ocean is one of Earth's final great frontiers. It's fun to imagine what all could be out there. It's such a great mystery, and scientists believe there could be more than 90% of undiscovered species in the ocean. Anyways, let's start off with the 80%. I kind of did that in the intro, I was talking about how the ocean is so massive, you know, 71% of the earth is covered by the ocean, and it's possible that 90% of the species in the ocean are still undiscovered, which is truly mind-blowing. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is a garbage patch that's a whole bunch of debris that's collected in the North Pacific Ocean. It's the largest accumulation of ocean plastic in the world. It covers the estimated surface of 1.6 million square miles, which is twice the size of Texas, three times the size of France, if you're from Europe, if you're not American. This mass of plastic is roughly 80,000 tons. And there is other ocean garbage patches, but they're not as well known as this one, and they're not quite as big. This one is massive. Moving on to the Osborne Reef. In the early 1970s, there was this conservation effort to try to rebuild this coral reef, and what they decided to use were tires from cars. So that's exactly what they did. They dumped between 1 and 2 million tires, approximately 36 acres of the ocean floor covered in tires, which is like... A, a ridiculous amount. This is just off the coast of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and it turned into a conservation nightmare. The new coral never attached to the rubber, which they for some reason thought, and the ropes that held the tires together actually disintegrated and the tires went everywhere. No new marine life habitat grew because of this, and the tires spreading out actually destroyed a whole bunch of other coral reefs in the area. There's been various efforts to retrieve the tires and dispose of them, uh, but it's really difficult to pull up a whole bunch of tires out of the ocean. Obviously, it was a ridiculous amount. Um, there's an estimated 500,000 still out there. And supposedly, I don't know this for sure, but Goodyear allegedly provided many of the tires and even christened the reef by dropping a gold-plated tire into the ocean from the Goodyear blimp. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I think that is true. All right, the purple orb. In 2016, this purple orb was found deep in the ocean uh, near the Chanel Islands off the coast of California. It absolutely stumped scientists at the time. They thought it was like a sea slug or some sort of egg sack. But even since it's been discovered, nobody knows what it was. So it was like an ocean anomaly that no one could figure out what it was, and we still don't know to this day. Giant oarfish. Giant oarfish are the longest known living bony fish that exist. They can reach the length of 56 feet long and grow up to 600 pounds. Encounters with live giant oarfish are so rare, uh, it wasn't even until 2001 when they actually found one and captured one, which was found by the US Navy. 
The majority of the giant oarfish that have been seen have all washed up on beaches dead. But it's such a small amount of oarfish that have been seen, it's just like a handful of sightings. Giant oarfish have no teeth, they feed on tiny planktons and they're believed to live around 650 feet to 3500 feet deep. Many believe that the giant oarfish is what caused many sea serpent myths in ancient times and in more modern times too. Uh, but I mean, these things really are sea serpents, so why not? Lake of Despair. Also known as the Jacuzzi of Despair, this is an underwater brine pool that kills almost anything that enters it. Like imagine being a marine biologist and you see a pool that anything that goes into dies. I think you would also call it the Pool of Despair. Uh, it's located in the Gulf of Mexico and measures about 100 feet in circumference and reaches 12 feet deep. It's roughly 3,300 feet below the surface also, so pretty deep. It's five times saltier than the surrounding seawater and it contains methane. So it's so dense that it doesn't mix with the rest of the water. Because of this, brine pools have been considered to be among the most extreme environments on Earth. Sea monsters. Mythical sea creatures have been all throughout history and even into modern day. They've been characterized as floating spirits or humongous beasts or even like supernatural human-like creatures. Like the Ningen. Wherever you are in the world, I'm sure there's been a tale or story uh, of a sea monster close to you. Which, this will be covered further down the iceberg. There's a lot of sea monsters that people don't think are real that definitely are. During the Age of Exploration, seas were being charted all over the world, resulting in legends of sea monsters like suddenly arising. There's some claims that sea monsters will feed on humans or even take down entire ships, which maybe they can. Others are that they can enchant humans and that few escape to tell the tale, so that's why we don't really know what they are or where they came from. Were these simply fun stories, or were these events based on factual evidence? The 400-year-old shark. You guys may have heard of this. The oldest shark to ever be recorded was a Greenland shark at nearly 400 years old. It set the record for the oldest vertebrae animal to ever live. The way that the scientists were able to calculate how old it was was by taking proteins out of its eyes and then doing radiocarbon dating. Many people believe these sharks really are this old, and it really is amazing if they are, because that means they would have seen the creation of America, the American Revolution, the building of the Taj Mahal, the building of the guillotine, a lot of crazy stuff in history. Pretty crazy. Moving on to Tier 2. Up first, we have the Bermuda Triangle. This is a mysterious section that goes between Florida, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. It's a triangle area, obviously. For centuries, the Bermuda Triangles has captured the curiosity of everybody who learns about it. I don't know about you guys, but like, I remember hearing about this back in like elementary school and uh, thinking that there was like a teleporting place that where you went into, you would just disappear. I definitely thought that was real. I'm pretty sure it was explained to me that way. So I feel like a lot of people don't know about this, but Christopher Columbus was sailing through the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, he was in the Atlantic Ocean in 1492. And he reported to have strange sightings. He saw stars appear to move across the sky and a light that was like a candle moving up and down in the distance. He said that when he asked his crew about the light, it vanished and reappeared many times. But the most unusual thing that Columbus said that he saw was a glowing object coming out of the water and shooting towards the sky. Many people think this may have been a light from another ship coming from shore uh, or something like that. Another mystery about the Bermuda Triangle is the Ellen Austin cargo ship. The crew aboard this ship found a boat drifting along inside of the Bermuda Triangle. They decided that it had likely just been abandoned, and the captain ordered four members of his crew to board the boat and sail it to New York. However, on the third day of sailing, the crew were said to disappear from the boat. When the captain ordered a new crew to board the small boat, they disappeared too. We still don't know why these disappearances occurred. Uh, some scientific explanation point to there being an area that's prone to tropical storms and make it difficult to navigate, and there being hard places to get through because of shallow coral reef systems in the area. Hitting these could cause massive damage to the hulls of these ships, and people may have just jumped ship. Another explanation is that ships or planes are destroyed by pockets of flammable methane gas that are known to exist in large quantities underneath the sea. Other people say that maybe lightning or electrical spark could ignite these huge methane pockets and cause ships or planes that are above them to just sink straight into the sea without a trace. 
There's a lot of cool mystical theories about it, like how there's sea monsters in the area, or that this area is where the lost city of Atlantis is, so that's why they go missing, because they have really advanced technology. But I personally think Atlantis is somewhere else, which we'll get into later. Alright, moving on to the Green Flash. The Green Flash is a phenomenon that is actually real. In Pirates of the Caribbean, when Captain Jack came back from Davy Jones' locker, there was a Green Flash, and that's when he came back. And in mythology, it's the same way. When a soul leaves Davy Jones' locker, that's when it's said the Green Flash happens. But in reality, what happens is an optical phenomenon. It's a mirage or a disposition of light. As the sun dips below the horizon, light is being distributed through the Earth's atmosphere like a prism. So as the light passes through the ocean spectrum, some of the flash of green can be seen for a few seconds. You can see this actually anywhere you can get a clear view of stuff like that, like the horizon, like at the ocean or on a plane or just anywhere you can see like the tops of, you know, mountain tops and that sort of thing. There's an old proverb that goes, Glimpse, you are the green ray. Count the morrow a fine day. Thank you for put, adding that. Atlantis. Atlantis is a mythical island nation that was written by the ancient Greeks, actually by Plato, uh, back around 22,000 years ago. According to Plato, Atlantis was a naval power located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which is the modern-day Strait of Gibraltar. Gibraltar. I, I think that's how you pronounce it. They conquered many parts of the Western European nation and Africa around 9,000 years ago, according to Plato. He also stated that the founders of Atlantis were demigods. So they're said to be really, really powerful, have a lot of technology that no one else had back then. Many people believe that Atlantis was a metaphor for nations that were really powerful or just stories about demigods, that sort of thing. But there's a lot of people out there that believe that Atlantis is genuinely real and that it is the Eye of the Sahara. So there was these guys recently on Joe Rogan, they talked about how Atlantis, very likely if it was anywhere in the world, it was the Eye of the Sahara. The reason that these guys, they're like really deep researchers on Atlantis, the reason they think this is because there was this guy, uh, Pomponius Mela, I think that's what his name was, he did map making back in Greek times, and he depicted Atlantis as being right there in the Eye of the Sahara, which is modern day the Eye of the Sahara Desert which is really, really cool. They also think that this was Atlantis because the Eye of the Sahara has red, black, and white stone in this ring-like area that all surrounds the city, which the story of Atlantis also has the pillars, which were like the levees or whatever you want to call it, also having red, black, and white stone. So that's super interesting. And then one more thing that makes them think that the Eye of the Sahara is Atlantis is because of the geography of it. The Atlantis story said that there was the mountains in the north, and the mountains are in the north of the Eye of the Sahara, like exactly in the north, and that there's a canal running to the south, which is exactly like the Eye of the Sahara as well, which is really crazy. So in the story of Atlantis, Plato says that the super technologically advanced city all was destroyed and sunk to the bottom of the ocean, in a single day because of catastrophic earthquakes and floods. Uh, but to this day, no one has truly proven where Atlantis is or if Atlantis really was real. I think it was, and I think we need to find it. Moving on, the sea monster of Daedalus. I found a couple cool things concerning this monster. The first account was in the 19th century by a warship of the British Navy. It was named the HMS Daedalus. In August 1848, Captain Macquah of the Daedalus and several of his officers said that they saw a sea serpent. The vessel sighted this enormous serpent between Cape of Good Hope and St. Helena. The serpent was said to be swimming with its head four feet above water, which is really high, and then the crew believed there was another 60 feet behind it. So it was like 64 feet long, which is massive. They said it was like dark brown, it had a yellowish white color around its throat, and was moving about 14 miles an hour, which is pretty fast. Seven members of the crew said that they saw this thing, and they saw it for like 20 minutes, so that's a really long time. Another crew member said that he thought it was like a lizardy serpent thing. Many biologists today think that it was just a whale. But there is something in Greek mythology that talked about a creature just like the Daedalus. And according to myth, this sea monster was like a gigantic beast that lived in the Mediterranean Sea and terrorized sailors and fishermen. So that's cool. The creature was said to have the body of a serpent and the head of a bull and be so large that it could engulf ships whole. 
Moving on to the Kaz-2. The Kaz-2 was a yacht that was found adrift uh, on the coast of Australia in 2007. When a rescue team boarded the vessel, they found it completely empty, and there was no sign of the three men that were believed to be on board. It was really strange because the men just seemed to disappear without a trace. They didn't take life jackets. Some believe that maybe they were caught in a storm and they just abandoned ship, which would be very strange. However, there was evidence that someone had disabled the radio on the ship, so it could have been pirates that were trying to take it over or something, and they decided to abandon it, or maybe they just captured the people for whatever reason. Uh, however, the Cause 2 disappearance is still a mystery to this day. One really weird thing about the Cause 2 is that the table was completely set, and it was like people were ready to eat, and they just abandoned so quick that they left everything set and ready to eat, so it was like... It had to be something crazy that happened. Moving on to tier 3. The first one on here is the Immortal Jellyfish. This one's super cool. I feel like people don't talk about this enough, but it has kind of gotten popular recently. The Immortal Jellyfish is biologically immortal. It can be found in the Mediterranean Sea and in the waters of Japan. The way it stays immortal is that it reverts back to its juvenile form after it's reached sexual maturity, effectively being able to live forever. This process is called transdifferentiation. It occurs when jellyfish are facing adverse conditions such as starvation, predation, or physical damage. It's a really efficient way to do cell recycling, which is a really important form of study right now because scientists are looking at how to replace cells that are damaged or damaged from cancer or stuff like that. So the immortal jellyfish is the only example of animals that could potentially live forever. Although it is worth noting that they could die from like disease or injury or being eaten, so... They don't actually live forever. I mean, I guess some theoretically could, but probably not. Moving on to Rogue Waves. This is something I really wanted to add because I feel like nobody talks about Rogue Waves enough because they're so interesting. So Rogue Waves have been part of marine folklore for centuries. Uh, there's all kinds of sailors and old pirates and stuff talking about how these crazy waves come out of nowhere in a seemingly calm day and will just like capsize a boat. And everybody looks at them and they're like, oh, they're crazy. There's like no way, right? Well... It was only until like the past few decades that we realized that they were actually telling the truth. So rogue waves hadn't even been seen until like 1990 when there was this oil rig set up and they had a camera on the outside and it was just like, you know, normal wave, normal wave, ridiculously massive wave. And they're like, wow, you know what? This is real. Rogue waves can be pretty big to pretty small. Uh, they're usually twice the size of the surrounding waves, and they're extremely unpredictable, like you never know when it's going to happen. They often come whenever the winds change directions, and due to their unpredictability, it's really difficult to gather evidence on their existence, so that's why nobody really knew about it until like the 90s. Another story about Christopher Columbus, I know I'm talking about him a lot. This might be just another Christopher Columbus story you like to tell a lot, like how he talked about how he saw mermaids, but they were just manatees. But in 1492, he reported of seeing a wave that was way higher than the ship's mast. Actually, a couple months ago, the Viking Polaris cruise ship was hit by a rogue wave while traveling through the Drake Passage near Argentina, which is like a really dangerous area. Uh, and this resulted in one death and several others being injured. A four-story tall wave that briefly reared up in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Canada in 2020 was the most extreme version of this freaky phenomenon that was ever recorded. It was three times the size of any waves around it, and it could have been really, really bad if it hit any ships. But this phenomenon is really rare, and ships are just not built to withstand these waves, so maybe that's what happens in the Bermuda Triangle. Maybe these oil tankers and big ships that are really not made to sink, sink, because they're hit by waves that are not meant to happen. Next, we have the Mary Celeste. This is probably the most famous ghost ship story of all time, uh, the Mary Celeste was a merchant ship that was adrift in the Atlantic Ocean on December 4th, 1872, and there was nobody on board. The ship had left New York November 7th, bound for Genoa, Italy, with a total of 10 people on board with a large cargo of alcohol. But it was found over a month later with no signs of the crew and nothing even being taken. So there's a lot of weird things about this. Nothing was taken, so it was like if pirates came to get them, they definitely would have taken the alcohol. I mean, why wouldn't they? They're pirates. Uh, the last known log of the ship was November 25th at 5 a.m. The lifeboat was missing, though, so maybe they were trying to escape from something. Uh, but there was no signs of struggle or violence on board of the ship. The ship's personal belongings and other documents were still in place. However, the ship's compass was removed from the housing. And there was a large quantity of seawater that was found in the ship's hold. But, I mean, back at that time, there was a lot of water that usually got into the ships and it wasn't that big of a deal. 
but there is no evidence of any leaks or damages to the ship other than scratches being on the front of the hole, which could have been a sea monster. The mystery of what happened in the Mary Celeste has still never been solved, but there's many theories that have came throughout the years. Some believe that the ship was abandoned due to a mutiny, and others think that the crew may have gotten lost at sea or killed by pirates, but I mean, the pirates would have taken the stuff, and if there was a mutiny, why wouldn't they just take the ship? Others believe that the ship was deliberately abandoned due to problems or emergency, like the alcohol, sometimes the alcohol could pop or like do little explosions whenever they're traveling, but these sailors should have been used to that. So it's still a mystery, nobody knows why. I also, I watched, uh, when Nagoon had a video talking about this, and it was, it was really good. He did a good job explaining that, you guys should watch that if you haven't. The Devil's Sea. This is something that many people compare to the Bermuda Triangle because of its high incidences of ships and planes disappearing under mysterious circumstances. This is an area of the sea where a whole bunch of disastrous events have happened, going all the way back to the 13th century. The leader of the Mongol Empire said that he sent a fleet of hundreds to possibly thousands of ships to Japan in hopes of conquest. However, an estimated 80% of his fleet was destroyed due to a typhoon in the area of the Devil's Sea. Another time in 1944, there was a Japanese pilot during the war who was having a weird experience during heavy combat during the US forces. Toshiki Lang claims that he caught sight of a huge sea monster as he traversed the Devil's Sea during a aerial battle. He said that this serpent-like monster quickly swam through the waters and had its head above water, and that it had two triangular wings that helped it navigate through the churning waters. This creature was supposedly 150 feet long. This is super interesting because there's a Chinese legend that dates back to like 1000 BC talking about this giant dragon that inhabits this part of the world in particular. Many planes and ships have gone missing in this area or have wrecked due to unknown reasons. Many theories suggest that this area may be prone to rogue waves or other natural phenomenon that causes ships or planes to go down, uh, while others believe that it's just like human error or whatever. Uh, but it's a lot like the Bermuda Triangle. Up next, we've got Big Fin Squid. This is the largest Big Fin Squid, uh, 21 feet long. It's freaking horrifying looking. I included this in the iceberg because it was really scary looking and I thought you guys would find it interesting. Uh, since the 1980s, there's been about a dozen sightings of these things, uh, but it's so deep in the water that almost no one even sees it. They have these super long tentacles that are at like a 90 degree angle, uh, so it gives them this creepy appearance. It's believed that they hold them like this so that they can drag them across the ocean floor and grab food with their tentacles. There was this really popular recording of one that was in the Gulf of Mexico, where it was at this really deep oil rig where it caught this video of one. It was really creepy. I probably am showing it to you right now. But it was also on Joe Rogan. They talked about it, and it was really cool. Anyways, it's just a creepy monster. It's just weird that these things exist and that we just accept them as squids, even though they're monsters. Next, we have the world's oldest mammal. Do you guys know this one? It is the bowhead whale. So there's one particular bowhead whale that has a really cool story. In the early 2000s, there was this Alaska indigenous hunting party that found fragments of a harpoon lodged in the shoulder of a bowhead whale. There was a biologist present with this group, and he presented this to a lab to be dated. And they figured out that this particular harpoon was 130 years old. So this harpoon has been stuck in this whale for 130 years. Fragments that they found of this harpoon made them realize that it was from a very particular place. It was manufactured in Massachusetts back, back around 1885. And then I guess people were trying to hunt this whale with this thing and they failed and it escaped and it lived for another 130 years. So that's crazy and epic. Back then there was this huge demand for whale blubber. They used it for like everything. Most lamps at the time used it so there was a huge boom in the whaling industry. However, these whalers would not go after calves, so they had to get these massive harpoons. So that meant that this whale was probably already in adulthood when it got harpooned, which meant that this whale was probably right around 200 years old, or maybe a little bit older. So that sucker was super old. Moving on, Point Nemo. Have you ever heard of the world's most isolated place called Point Nemo? I had a video that did really popular about Point Nemo. But it's the most isolated place on Earth. There's no point in on Earth that's further from land than Point Nemo. It's actually so isolated that if you were there alone, the closest other people to you would be the people on the International Space Station as it goes overhead. It goes around like pretty fast over the Earth, so they would come over every like 90 minutes or so. I think that's right. Which they would be 258 miles from you, and the closest other people to you would be 1,600 miles away. 
super far away. So the fastest time anybody has ever got to Point Nemo was 15 days. So if you needed help, they could probably get to you a little bit faster, but roughly 15 days is how long it takes normal people to get to Point Nemo. It's really far away. It's really out of the way. To get there, it would be the equivalent of driving two-thirds across the United States. Another interesting thing is that the bloop noise was actually heard really close to Point Nemo, which is something that we're going to talk about later. The bloop is a super interesting thing. One other interesting thing about Point Nemo is that this is close to the Lovecraftian city of Rayla, which is this sunken city in the South Pacific Ocean that is the prison of this entity called Cthulhu. So many people relate the bloop in Cthulhu and say that the bloop is Cthulhu, but we'll get into the bloop later, we'll talk about it. Let's go ahead and get into the fourth tier. All right, on the top of tier four, we have the Yonaguni Monument. So this is like Japan's Atlantis. The Yonaguni Monument is what many believe to be a giant human-built pyramid that's underneath the ocean. It's this enormous underwater rock formation that covers almost 200 feet and it's located just off the coast of Yonaguni Jima, which is an island that lies 75 miles off the coast of Taiwan. It's speculated to have existed for more than 10,000 years. Now, while some believe this was built by an advanced prehistoric society, others debate whether its formation was completely man-made or entirely natural. However, what's really strange about it is there's really intricate carvings of animals and stairs and other formations in it. It was first discovered in the mid-1980s by a scuba diver who was looking for hammerhead sharks. There's these really human-looking made pyramid structures that bear evidence of a lost civilization potentially, which in this area there's believed to be something called the Lost Continent of Mu, which is sort of like Japanese Atlantis. In the structure, many have identified there being like a pyramid, this castle, roads, pool, and a stadium, and several really artificial looking things that support the theory, like a whole bunch of right angles, it looks like tools carved it, uh, retaining walls, something that looks like a road, drainage canals, gates, stairways, and two carved monuments that are shaped like turtles. So with all this evidence, it's really hard to believe that this occurred naturally. It really looks like it was created by a man, so it's pretty crazy and you should look more into it. Moving on to the 2003 Great White Incident. So the 2003 Great White Incident was the situation where this 9-foot Great White Shark was tagged off the coast of Australia. The shark was tagged with this tag that was just set to record the temperatures and depths of the shark, and the data that this tag showed four months later was absolutely insane. It essentially seems that the shark was both eaten and dragged down to the ocean floor. So what happened was the female great white shark dove to the depths of about 1,903 feet. The temperature surrounding the tag spiked from 46 degrees to 78 right whenever it got to the bottom, suggesting that it was eaten by something that we don't know. Researchers guessed that a large animal came up from underneath the shark and grabbed it and dragged it to the bottom, where the shark was then swallowed, causing the dramatic dive and then the 32 degree temperature spike. So a lot of people speculated that this animal that grabbed the shark was like a large great white or perhaps an orca. However, it wouldn't make sense because the internal temperatures of great white sharks are between 65 to 70 degrees and the orca's internal temperatures are 90 degrees Fahrenheit, so it doesn't line up with the 78 degrees that the tag jumped to. And despite everybody looking into this, researchers are still not sure what ate the shark. It maybe could have been something a bit more horrifying than we think. A giant squid or a megalodon, uh, probably the kraken in my opinion. Uh, but whatever it is, it was large enough to take on a nine foot great white shark and drag it all the way to the bottom and you know, not be an orca or a great white, so. Truly insane. Moving on. The Biblical Leviathan. So to start off with every religion throughout the world, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, they all have a story that involves a giant Leviathan sea monster that lurks in the depths of the ocean. I'm going to be focusing on the creature that was mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible. Now I'm not going to read all the passages, but like Job 3.8, Job 41.12, Isaiah 12.1, or Isaiah 27.1, they all talk about this massive monster called the Leviathan. It's like this creature that was said to cause infliction on humanity. From the passages I mentioned, we can gather that the Leviathan lived in the sea or a big body of water and was a creature to be reckoned with. It appears to be large in size, have plated armor, sharp teeth, and the ability to spit fire from its mouth. Essentially, the Leviathan had the skin of a dragon without any weak spots. It had sharp teeth, could breathe fire like I just said. His breath alone was described to be able to kindle coals and his nostrils emitted smoke. The sea even boiled around him as he traveled through the water. 
So could this be an ancient sea monster, sea serpent? A uh, plesiosaur, a uh, mosasaur? Some say it was 300 miles long, but I couldn't find a description on why or where it said that anywhere. Uh, but essentially, I think it's supposed to represent the enemies of Israel who were then slain by God. Uh, it's like a metaphor for that. Or it might just be a real sea monster. Anyways, next on the list I have Kraken is real. Oh, look, there's a kitty. <laughs> Kitty's getting in my shot. So to start off with, we just don't know very much about the ocean. We didn't even capture a giant squid until 2006. That was just like 15 years ago. That was really, really recent. 17? It was really recent, guys, come on. So I, I personally think that there are giant squids large enough to be real life krakens. I mean, we just haven't seen so much stuff. The giant squids are like these mysterious deep sea predators that live at the depths of like 2,900 feet below the ocean's surface. They seem to prefer cold temperatures of the far north or the far south of our oceans. And they've only been filmed in their natural environments twice ever. So if we've only filmed these things twice, then imagine what we have never seen. The biggest giant squid ever found was 43 feet long, which included its tentacles, which that's about the size of a semi-truck trailer. However, scientists estimate that the species may be able to grow up to 66 feet long based on the size of a giant squid beak that was found in the stomach of sperm whales, which they prey on giant squids, which is pretty crazy to think about. Uh, that's all according to the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Natural History. But just think about how massive the ocean is and all the species we haven't discovered. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot larger ones that we've never found. All the stuff that sinks to the bottom and all the deep sea giganticism, all those creatures that get massive because of the depths of the sea. I mean, that is just insane in general. I don't think I added that to the iceberg, but like deep sea giganticism, so crazy. You would think that the immense pressure of the ocean would make something grow smaller but what it does is make it grow larger so it can go further because it's such massive spaces in the ocean so perhaps the norse legend surrounding the kraken derived from the giant squid that's pretty much the idea of that on there all right moving on to globster so a globster also referred to as blobs is an undefined organic mass that washes up on shorelines they're characterized as being really hard to identify at least by initial untrained eyes and creating controversy over their identity most of the time, they have no visible eyes, no defined head, and no apparent bone structure. But later on, in just a second, we're about to talk about a couple of the most well-known globsters. So I'll get into that in just a second. The German U-Boat 60-Foot Crocodile. Okay, so bear with me here. In 1915, during World War I, a German U-Boat identified as the U-28 torpedoed and sank a British steamer called the SS Iberian. The Iberian sank stern first and the bow aimed directly upwards and after about 25 seconds uh, underwater there was another very large explosion which was most likely the Iberian's boilers exploding. During this second explosion the U-28 crew said that they saw something odd. The commander said the wreckage remained beneath the water for approximately 25 seconds at the depth that remains clearly impossible to assess when suddenly there was a violent explosion which shot pieces of debris, among them a gigantic aquatic creature out of the water to a height of approximately 80 feet. The commander along with six crew members saw a creature that they described as being a giant aquatic crocodile. They said it was about 60 feet long with four limbs resembling large webbed feet and having a large pointed tail and a head that tapered to a point, kind of like a crocodile. Uh, they couldn't get a picture because it sank within seconds. A lot of people don't believe this account because the 61 survivors of the SS Iberian didn't report the creature, or maybe they didn't think it was important. However, others note this as a credible source, and the clarity of the description is really good. Uh, so they say this could be like a sea serpent, but who knows? And you know, in the middle of the ocean, there's no way it could be a regular crocodile, so. Really strange. All right, tier five. First up, we have the Sargasso Sea's Carnivorous Seaweed. The Sargasso Sea is a really weird thing. It's this shoreless oval of water in the North Atlantic that measures about 2,000 miles wide. It is the only sea in the world not bound by land. It's bounded by all ocean currents on all sides, and the water rotates clockwise, revolving slowly like the eye of a hurricane. What's really crazy about the Sargasso Sea is that it's six feet higher than the rest of the ocean, which is crazy to think about. The area has struck terror into the minds of sailors for centuries. It was once known as the Horse Latitudes after Spanish ships were forced to throw their horses overboard to save drinking water because they didn't have any wind and they got stuck there. 
According to old folklore, stories of carnivorous seaweed in the Sargasso Sea were responsible for numbers of crews disappearing in the 1800s. This body of water is well known for the massive accumulations of sargassum, which is a certain dense type of brown seaweed that is massive. A number of empty ships have been found sailing through its waters with the crews just completely gone without a trace, uh, like the Mary Celeste, I talked about that earlier. But it's crazy to think that, like, if people fell in the water that this seaweed could, like, overcome them and eat them. I know we don't really have any proof of that, but, I mean, we have no idea where the crew went. Unless they just all sunk or were eaten by something else. But despite its fearsome reputation, this sea plays a really vital role in the North Atlantic ecosystem. It's referred to as the Golden Rainforest of the Ocean. Young sea turtles shelter in the thick mat of vegetation, and most of the world's freshwater eels are actually spawned here, which is an even bigger mystery that we will get into later, because all these eels spawn here and we have no idea how it works, we've never found their eggs, we don't know how they reproduce, it's really strange. We'll get into that later. Alright, vertical migration. This is a good one. So vertical migration is the idea that like sea monsters and creatures mentioned throughout history that we don't think are real, are real, but we don't see them because they literally migrate vertically or have plunged deeper into the depths of the ocean. So as more traffic crosses over the ocean, giant sea creatures like the Megalodon or the Kraken or other sea serpent-like things just go deeper. And they go where we're highly unlikely to see them due to darkness and pressure and just the sheer massiveness of the depths of the ocean. Which, I mean, other sea creatures are known to do this whenever there's more traffic, like squids and stuff, they migrate down whenever there's increased stuff moving over top of them. Uh, but we really haven't seen the colossal squid do this just because we haven't, you know, seen them in the wild, like hardly at all. But, you know, if they do that, then I would imagine that the even larger ones would do the same thing. So, it's crazy to think about. Moving on to the Mariana Trench. I'm sure most of you guys know about this one. It's located between Guam, the Philippines, and the Pacific Ocean. The Mariana Trench is the deepest oceanic region on the planet and also contains the lowest accessible point on Earth because, you know, there's possibly deeper points that we haven't seen that just aren't accessible, but that's a whole nother thing. It's over 36,000 feet below sea level, is 1,500 miles long, and stretches about 43 miles wide. To put that into perspective, the deepest point, the Challenger Deep, is thousands of feet deeper than Mount Everest is high. Commercial airliners actually fly at a lower altitude than that is deep. So just think about this, if you look up into the sky and you see a plane flying way above you, like at the maximum altitude that they fly, just think about being at the bottom of the ocean and looking at that plane, that would be like a boat sitting at the top of the ocean except add a few more thousand feet and then that would be it. The Mariana snailfish was recently discovered lurking at the depths of 26,000 feet and it's the deepest fish ever discovered on record. It's able to withstand the pressure of like 1,600 elephants standing on the roof of a car, so who knows what else could be down there. There's a lot of slugs, a lot of squids, uh, but you know, not very many fish whenever you get that deep. Only a few people have ever been down in the trench. The first two men were in 1960. Their descent took five hours and they only stayed at the bottom for about 25 minutes. It wasn't until 2012 when someone dared to go back, and that person actually happened to be James Cameron, the guy who made the Avatar movies. And the movie The Abyss, that's a good one. If you like this series, watch The Abyss, that's a great movie that he made. It's honestly really underrated. Anyway, since 2019 recently, there's been 25 people that have actually braved the Mariana Trench, going down in a vessel called the Limiting Factor. It's this $37 million two-seater submersible submarine that's like by a private company, like a bunch of rich people probably do it. I would love to do it, but that's going to take a few years or decades. Underground Ocean. So according to some scientists, there's this underwater ocean that's believed to be three times as large as our other oceans combined. But it's not like the oceans that we think about. Uh, using seismograph, these scientists have concluded that there's about, f that, that about 400 miles below the Earth's surface in the transitional zone, there's this material called ringwoodite, which is this spongy-like material that's actually attracting hydrogen and holding the water together in like this mo molecular structure. I actually talked about this on Facebook in a Facebook video about the ocean and they fact checked me. They're like, no, that's not real. These scientists also suggest the water seeped out of Earth rather than the traditional scientific theory that the Earth gained water by icy comets colliding with Earth. However, a lot of this is speculation because we've only found one piece of ringwoodite ever which arrived on the surface from a volcano in Brazil. Uh, but I still think it's cool to think that we potentially have like a massive ocean beneath the Earth 
Kind of like in the movie uh, the Journey to the Center of the Earth. They, they have a giant, giant ocean in that one. Heracleon, also known as Underwater Egypt. So, ancient Egypt has this lost city called Heracleon, also known as Thanos back in the day. Not Thanos, Thanos. It's perhaps the greatest submerged city ever discovered, and we're only just learning more about it, because it was really recently discovered. So, for centuries, everybody thought that this Greek historian named Herodotus uh, just made up the existence of Her Heracleon. Which is really funny because we just recently discovered it. It's believed to have been one of Egypt's greatest ports. Heracleon was believed to have collapsed into the Mediterranean after the 2nd century BC, or about 3200 years ago. It's located 1.6 miles off the coast of Egypt in the Mediterranean Sea, under about 30 feet of water. Which is 20 miles from Alexandria. The ruins of the city were discovered in 1999, but excavations are ongoing and every year we learn more and more and discover more. But this ancient city has just been, you know, lost underneath these waves for thousands of years. And it's just crazy to think that it was just lying right down there and we didn't even know. For centuries, everybody believed this was a myth, just like the city of Atlantis is viewed today. The mention of Heracleon only appeared in a few rare ancient texts that most historians really didn't bother looking at. But over time, the central island was built on this soil that liquefied and it, it weakened from like earthquakes and tsunamis and rising sea levels uh, to the point that all everything became liquid and the buildings and everything just collapsed about 3,000 years ago. All right, moving on to tier six. All right, guys, I know you guys watched the mermaid documentary. Don't lie. If you guys like my stuff, then you've probably seen the documentary or you would like the documentary, but it was called Mermaids, The Body Found, and there was another one called Mermaids, The New Evidence. It was a series by Animal Planet that aired in 2012 and 2013. Mermaids, The New Evidence at the time was airing was like the most successful show in Animal Planet history. The concept of the show was that mermaids were real and that the scientists of the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration were just hiding all the existence from the world. Animal Planet at the time had only been like showing real footage and factual information and almost everybody that watched this I feel like thought it was real but it was actually a mockumentary that they aired with like no disclaimer. I remember I was uh, in my grandma's house and I think we watched that and we all thought, me and my brother and sister all thought it was real. Um, but I'm sure you guys probably did too, because it was so strange. I saw a bunch of videos, people talking about the same thing. They all thought it was real. I was like, no way, mermaids. But you know, legends of mermaids go back thousands of years to Babylon, and stories can be found all over the world. But there's a lot of alleged remains of mermaids being found, like in Japan and Fukuoka, Japan. They said they found mermaids that wash ashore in 1222. The bones have been on display for 800 years, but have never been scientifically tested, so their origins are unknown. Uh, but even today, footage pops up everywhere of alleged mermaids washing up on shore, but almost everything has been a hoax. A lot of people think that manatees are the original mermaids, you know, all the tales of them. And if you look at it, the angle right, they do kind of look mermaidy. We saw manatees the other day. It was really cool. Moving on to the sinking of the Titanic. So you guys all know the story of the Titanic. It sank in 1912, the North Atlantic Ocean, uh, four days into the voyage to New York City. It hit a big iceberg. 2,000 people on board, 1,500 people died. Uh, it was the deadliest peacetime marine disaster ever in history. But there's a theory that suggests it didn't sink. The Titanic didn't sink. So the Titanic had a sister ship called the Olympic. And people think that it was disguised as the Titanic as an insurance scam by the owners. The owners of the ship was the International Mercantile Marine Group, which was controlled by an American banker named J.P. Morgan. So the sister ship of the Titanic was damaged and JP Morgan didn't want to deal with fixing it. So he just replaced the Titanic with it and killed so many people. This is just a theory. It's pretty much been disproven. The Titanic's original building material was labeled 401 and the Olympics was labeled 400. And the only material pulled up from the Titanic is labeled 401. So, But there's another really cool theory that I like concerning JP Morgan. And it claims that you know JP Morgan wanted to create the first U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, which I probably shouldn't say on YouTube, but I'm going to say it anyways, oh well. And he had a whole bunch of rivals that didn't want this Federal Reserve to exist. And so, all the millionaires that were against him, uh, John Jacob Astor, Benjamin Guggenheim, Isidore Stra Strauss, Isidore Strauss, all three rivals were on board the Titanic. And so, the idea is that J.P. Morgan was like, 
they're gonna stop me from making this Federal Reserve, may as well sink the entire ship, and that's what he did, but it's just an idea, there's no solid evidence on this. But all three of those millionaires did die on the ship, so... Alright, moving on to the Montauk Monster. This is probably one of the most famous globsters. It washed up on the shores of Montauk, New York in 2008. The body was said to have really strange features. It was stout, hairless, had claws, and like a beak. Which was really strange. Um, but it mysteriously disappeared and we're still not sure what the creature was. A lot of people thought that the creature was either like a raccoon or a sheep or a dog or like a turtle with no shell. However, the Marine Institute at Stonebrook University that was close disproved them all being one of these animals. However, there's one option that they couldn't disprove and that is that this animal was some sort of genetically modified creature that escaped from a nearby government lab. Which sounds crazy until you look at how this beach that this animal washed up at was literally only 15 miles away from the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. And it's directly across the harbor, so it makes sense that this thing washed up over here, especially since there was a whole bunch of various other strange animals washing up in the same area that people didn't know what they were. So, you know, maybe the Montauk Monster was that, but it's hard to get solid evidence on this stuff, so... Moving on. Aquatic Ape Theory. I'm not going to get too far into this. In 1960, a marine biologist named Alistair Hardy introduced the aquatic ape theory that states that, like, our ancestors once spent a whole bunch of time in water and that a bunch of characteristics of humans are marked out different from other apes because they had adaptations to spending time in water. Uh, basically, the idea is that the features that humans have, like our swimming ability, uh, loss of body hair, the curving of our body, the reduced resistance of water, a uh, layer of fat underneath our skin, and then like our babies being able to hold their breath underwater as soon as they're born. Uh, it all suggests that maybe our ability to walk upright may have developed through wading through water, and that basically we evolved from water monkeys. Anyways, this theory has a lot of pushback in the scientific community. Moving on, St. Augustine Monster. The St. Augustine Monster was a name given to a large carcass which was originally thought to be the remains of a gigantic oct octopus that washed ashore on the United States coast near St. Augustine, Florida in 1896. It was one of the earliest recorded examples of a globster ever. The carcass was very pale pink, almost white in color. It was composed of a rubbery substance, it was very hard consistency, and it was really hard to cut this thing. They couldn't hardly cut through it. The part of the carcass that was visible measured 18 feet in length, 7 feet in width, so it was huge. It weighed like 5 tons, if not more. And it was also swept back into the sea for a while, for like a few days during a storm. Uh, but it resurfaced, and they're like, we gotta get this thing back on shore so we can use it as a dead animal tourist attraction. Uh, so with the help of six horses and a bunch of men, they ended up moving it several miles closer inland, where it was protected from the tide. Uh, but the, the carcass did become like a tourist attraction, and it was visited by a ton of people, and it's unknown what happened to the carcass afterwards. But in 1995, an analysis concluded that the St. Augustine monster was probably like a large, massive whale blubber, likely like a sperm whale. So no huge mystery there, but it's still pretty interesting that it became like a huge tourist attraction. Everybody thought that this massive flesh was like a monster and they all came and saw it. Just cool to think about. Tier 7, Phantom Island Bermeja. So Bermeja is this phantom island that supposedly existed off of the coast of Mexico, just off the Yucatan coast. It was this 80 square kilometer sized island that first appeared on maps in the early 1500s and was last mapped in the 1940s. There's a lot of really strange things about this island. Obviously it's called the Phantom Island because it disappeared or was never even there. So here's the deal, most countries, wherever their islands are, they get 200 miles to do oil and Bermeja Island would have greatly benefited Mexico. So a lot of people think that Mexico either just cling to this idea of it still existing to benefit itself to get oil, or there's a couple other conspiracies like one that states that the CIA, I'm not saying this is real, but the CIA learned about the island and since nobody could really prove it was there at that point, they bombed it and destroyed it so that they would have the power to drill oil in that area. But there's obviously no proof that the CIA did that for sure. It's just kind of a strange theory. There was this guy in the Mexico Senate, or he was a governor, I'm not really for sure, but he was part of the government structure who was like super 
pro this island, like he really thought it existed. And what's really strange is that he mysteriously died because he was trying to lobby for oil for Mexico and he somehow died. And a lot of people link it to like the CIA bombing the island and leveling it so that it never existed. But that probably didn't happen. So don't don't go too far into that. Anyways, like I said, this island would greatly benefit Mexico due to the exclusive economic zone that it would have 200 miles offshore. It would literally give them 15% more territory of oil rich area, which is huge. And this would encroach on American territory. So this is where some of the conspiracy theories come from. So anyways, Mexico really wanted this island to exist and they explored these areas during like the 1990s and in 2009, uh, but they were never able to ever find this island. Some people hypothesize that the island did exist and that natural erosion caused the island to disappear over time, but I think this is an unlikely theory considering that the ocean floor is just flat in that area that people thought it was. But another theory is that the person who created the map just made it up to make a signature on his maps, and that's what people used to do back in the day. These cardiographers would make up like a fake island or something and then put it on their map, and so if someone copied their map then it would have this island kind of like a signature so that they could tell when people were copying what they did. And so that's what most people think it was. Anyways, there's still other speculations that this island really was there and that it just like moves, kind of like if you've ever seen the show Lost, they have that island that it's like, well, I don't want to spoil what Lost is, but it's like this island moves around and nobody can figure out where it's at, so nobody can escape and that sort of thing, so maybe it's the Lost Island. Okay, moving on to the Baltic Sea Anomaly. If you don't know what this is, this is pretty much like this rock formation that was found back in 2011 that looks a lot like a UFO that crashed into the ocean. So in 2011, there was this Swedish-based Ocean X team that were trying to go find this old shipwreck, but they ended up finding this oval-shaped object with strange markings on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea lies between Sweden and Finland, and the sonar image that they got was really blurry, but it was really interesting. It like got really popular on the internet, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, it's the Millennium Falcon! Because it really does look like the Millennium Falcon, it's pretty cool. They claim that their image that they got shows a 200 feet in diameter circular object that looks extremely man-made. They thought it was man-made themselves. So later on, samples of the stone that were recovered at the site by the Ocean X team were given to an associate professor of geology at Stockholm University. The analysis of the samples indicated that they were just a normally occurring formation made of normal materials. But I mean, it is really strange. There was one really interesting thing that I saw on it where people said that when they got close to it with cameras and other electrical equipment, they would shut off and not work. But I mean, I try to watch a documentary on this and read a lot of different things on it, but it's just a whole lot of he said, she said. There's not anything too in depth with it other than it's this rock formation that looks exactly like the Millennium Falcon. Uh, or just some sort of UFO. It looks really man-made. It really does. So there's no concrete evidence on any of this, but it's still fun to just think that maybe there's some sort of advanced underwater civilization that created this, or maybe some ancient civilization dumped this thing in the water, which would be really cool too. Okay, moving on to Cosmic Ocean. So the idea of Cosmic Oceans is like the entire world is enveloped in these Cosmic Oceans, which are space. So there's a lot of religions and cultures throughout history and civilizations that refer to the world or the cosmos as being enveloped in primordial waters. In ancient creation texts, the primordial waters often represent the originality of the universe as being the entire universe is in these huge waters and that a space was separated from these waters for us to live in. So people theorize that the creation story in the Bible kind of talks about this, like God created a space inside of the water that was separate from the primordial waters, which is the universe around earth. Just like in Genesis 1, 6, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, I'm not saying this is how it is in the Bible. This is just a theory that people have came up with. But also in Genesis, the story of Noah and how the waters were opened up from the heavens and came down onto Earth. People theorize that this is part of the cosmic ocean theory as well. This is like tied in with like hollow earth theory and a lot of weird stuff, but it's like there's a firmament over the Earth and above it is all water and that the firmament was opened up and the waters came through and that people don't go to space, space is fake. And that everything in the cosmos is ocean except for us, we're the only solid ground. And so that's the theory, I'm not saying it's true, it's really strange, it's really wacky, but that's the cosmic ocean theory. 
Okay, moving on to Ningen. Ningen is a creature that appears in recent Japanese folklore. The Ningen, which translates to the word human, is a 50 foot or longer bulbous creature that was originally spotted by a Japanese research vessel off the coast of Antarctica. These are all like alleged sightings and that sort of thing, you know, it's kind of like a cryptid. So upon the first sighting of it, members of a Japanese research vessel thought that they were seeing a foreign submarine off in the distance getting closer to it and then they realized that it was a living animal. Their reports described it as an aquatic humanoid fish said to be roughly the size of a whale. The creature was described as being pale white having really human like figures like no eyes but kind of a nose and a mouth I think they have a mouth and that they have these weird arms and then a tail that goes into a mermaid looking thing like a whale tail. But some people claim that it has legs like in this weird picture it's really weird. Some other people describe it as having really minimal facial features, having like small slitted mouth and two eyes, while others just make it look like a no face looking humanoid whale creature. I guess it's been spotted multiple times, uh, primarily at night in colder waters, leading some to believe that it's been hiding in the arctic beneath the ice. In this iceberg, I meant for the Ningen to be less of a creature and more of like an idea that there are things out there that we don't know about that might be a human-like creature that we've never seen before and that's what I meant for this to be like there's all kinds of creatures like especially in the Arctic and other areas that we really haven't been able to get into that might be out there and I feel like the Ningen is a great representation of that even though it's probably just a creature that probably doesn't exist kind of like well, I don't want to say like kind of like the bloop because I know a lot of you guys like that, but kind of like the bloop. Some people say things about the Ningen like it seeing like a mermaid, so maybe it came from that myth about the sirens and that sort of thing. While others say that it's just like this ambient creature that floats around and is pretty docile. Anyways, it's pretty creepy looking. I would not want to run into one. Okay, the untouchable bathysphere fish. So this is a story of some of the earliest ocean exploration. In 1932, there was a marine biologist named William Beebe. He was exploring the abyssal depths of the Bermuda Seas in a bathysphere, which this was like a submarine looking thing that he had. It was like a really early form of submarine. Anyways, it was this spherical chamber that he would go down deep into the ocean with, which is really crazy to think about people going down there this early. It was in 1932. Anyways, once William was down there, he apparently saw two large, six-foot-long fish, which represented both barracudas and black dragonfish. He said they had a row of blue bioluminescent spots running down both sides of their bodies in two long anglerfish-like lures, one reddish located underneath the chin and the other blue located on the tail. And he named these fish the giant dragonfish, also known as the untouchable bathysphere fish. He also discovered four other mysterious fish while he was down there. These were the paladin sailfin, the abyssal rainbow gar, the five line constellation fish, and the three starred anglerfish. So this guy went down there really early in the years of ocean exploration and he saw these fish. What's sad is he didn't get any specimens so nobody believed him. <laughs> so he didn't collect anything. The only proof he had was the descriptions that he gave of each species. But since then, no physical specimens have been discovered, not even by fishermen. So it leads one to question, did he make all this up? Or did these fish go deeper in the ocean, or did they die out? I would assume that since we've been exploring the ocean more, we would have found these things since then, especially since he just went down there and found them so quickly. So the true nature of these fish are still debated. Some speculate that BB misidentified these fish and that they were already known deep sea creatures that he had just stumbled upon and he described them wrong, while others theorize that these fish may have gone extinct since then, which could explain why we haven't found any physical specimens of them. But some hold on to the possibility that these fish are all still down there and they're just still waiting to be discovered, but I mean, why wouldn't they still not be discovered since the scientists assume that like 90% of ocean species still haven't been discovered yet? It could also be like vertical migration, you know, these fish, they're deep sea fish, Maybe they went deeper because people are going across the ocean more. That makes a lot of sense to me. Pretty spooky to think about. Moving on to tier 8. Okay, the El Tannin Antenna. So this was an ocean anomaly. It was a really strange situation that happened. On August 29th, 1964, the USNS El Tannin, a floating laboratory created by the National Science Foundation of the United States, was engaged in photographing the ocean floor 1,000 miles off the coast of Cape Horn with a cable-mounted camera at a depth of approximately 13,000 feet. When they stumbled upon a remarkable find, 
So along this mostly bleak and barren bottom that they were in of the ocean, they managed to snap pictures of a very strange structure. This structure stood upright about two feet high and was in the middle of nowhere on the lifeless seabed. And it had symmetrical arms, spokes, and protrusions ending in spherical tops. It looked very much like an elaborate artificial radio antenna thingy. Photographs of the object immediately caught the attention of this UFOologist who dubbed it the El Tannen Antenna, and claimed that it was an out of place alien artifact put there in that remote location for unknown purposes. So since it was so far underneath the surface in this really hostile and inaccessible environment, there was like no way to reach it again and no efforts were made to ever try and relocate it. But a more plausible hypothesis is that this object could have been a type of deep sea carnivorous sponge, which was discovered almost a century before in 1888. But this is all really strange because if this sponge was here, what was it feasting on? It was in the middle of this barren wasteland really deep in the ocean. There have been a lot of arguments against this idea of it being the carnivorous sponge. One of the arguments is that the scientists that were on this vessel could not figure out what it was on their own, which was really strange because you would think they would know what a carnivorous sponge was. Another argument is that this species of sponge is known to exist in large colonies, where this one was just in solitude in potentially a desert of nothingness in the ocean. There's also the fact that when compared to the photos of the type of sponge that it was, it did not seem to match. It looked somewhat different, especially considering that it was obviously more symmetrical than most things found in nature. So if it's a carnivorous sponge or some sort of alien antenna is something that I will let you decide. I think it was probably a Cthulhu antenna. All right, moving on to the ocean at night. So I talked about vertical migration before. Vertical migration is the fact that whenever large ships move over the top of the ocean, bigger species tend to go deeper. So here's the deal with the ocean at night. So large predators that hunt during the day, they all use eyesight, so at night, deeper sea prey will come up to the surface so that they can eat like plankton and stuff that's up there. So this causes large deep sea predators to also come to the surface to eat the prey that's normally down there. Because these things don't need eyesight to hunt, they can hunt completely in the darkness. So the idea of the ocean at night is that these deep sea predators come up to the surface just like I said, and potentially it becomes a really dangerous place. So in 2010, there's this project called the Artificial Sun, which was conducted in the Gulf of Aden. It involved a bright thermal reactor, which had to be placed into the ocean to keep it from overheating. During this project, there was 82 earthquakes reported in a 48 hour period around this area. Shortly after, 27 different world navies sent their ships to fight pirates around the area. However, supposedly there was these leaked text logs that showed that there is a giant vortex in the area that they were actually responding to instead. Which this led a lot of people to believe that since it was night, you know, and the monsters came to the surface, or the predators came to the surface, they saw this giant light that was man-made and they were not happy about it. It was some sort of super intelligent predator that lives deep in the ocean that we don't know about and it started I don't know doing whatever it does with vortexes and earthquakes potentially like a Cthulhu looking thing but that's pretty much the idea of what it is it's like the ocean at night is really dangerous don't go to the ocean at night because these monsters might be closer to the surface and that's why you know people in the past that were sailing across the ocean had so many problems because I mean think about how long they had to be out in the ocean to cross different oceans Oh my gosh, it would be so scary to be out there in the middle of the night and something's bumping your boat or there's a rogue wave that somehow hits you and turns you over and then you gotta deal with trying to survive in the ocean, you can't breathe and yeah, it's just bad. I was also watching this other video that talked about how there was this guy who was doing like a marathon swim and that he was there at night for some reason swimming really far and the boat that was following him, they usually have boats that follow these people that do these marathons. This boat that followed him put the floodlights on top of him. And so he was swimming in the ocean, floodlights on top of him, middle of the night, and a cookie cutter shark came up and bit a chunk out of his leg. Now, what's really strange about this is that this cookie cutter shark probably had absolutely no idea what he was. This shark probably had never seen a human ever in its entire life. I mean, think about how many cookie cutter sharks actually even see humans. 
probably almost none. So there's definitely all kinds of creatures that come up to the surface that have never seen people, or any man-made anything for that instance. So this thing took a bite out of something it didn't know. It was a human, so who's to say other giant marine predators wouldn't do the same that are deep in the ocean. Okay, the Flannan Isle Mystery. This is a really interesting story. So on December 15th, 1900, this ship was passing this lighthouse that was supposed to be in operation, and they noticed that there was no light on it. So they shot a flare up, and they didn't respond at all. So they were like, that's really strange. We should probably go check that out. And so they did, and there was nobody there at all, which was really strange. So the ship docked and noticed that nobody was on board. So this lighthouse island that they had just arrived at was just off the coast of the United Kingdom in the Flannan Islands. It was manned by three men at the time, James Ducat, Thomas Marshall, and Donald MacArthur. So upon their arrival, the crew that noticed that they were gone found that the flagstaff had no flag. None of the usual provision boxes had been left on the landing stage for restocking, and none of the lighthouse keepers were there to welcome anybody. The captain of the Hesperus attempted to reach them by blowing the ship's whistle and he shot a flare. You know, he was unsuccessful like I said, so that's why they came aboard the island. So one man went up on the island to see what was going on and he found the entrance gate to the compound to be closed, all the beds were unmade, the clocks were unwound, some sources claimed that the table was set for a meal and that it had just not been eaten, they had just left with the meal uneaten. So everything looked completely normal. All the doors were shut to the house. So this seemed strange, the way the food had been set out and that all the doors were closed. It's like they had all just ran away all at once, but all the doors were closed. So, you know, what actually happened? So anyways, they got into the log books of what happened on the island, of what the people wrote that disappeared. And it looked like the people were slowly going more insane each day. At one point they had said that this bad storm had blown in and it was really strange because nobody right next to them on the coast said that there was any storm at all. So it was a really strange situation. In the logbooks they said it was bad the first day. Next day they were like, it's really, really bad. People have started to cry that were there. The three lighthouse keepers, one of them started to cry. And then the next day they were all praying because the storm had just gotten so bad. And then finally, the last day that the log was written, it said the storm had ceased and that God was all that remained. So this led people to think that they were maybe being judged by God or some sort of supernatural situation. It's just all around a really weird thing. So what did happen? You know, the men seemed to just disappear. All the doors were shut. The food was set. They had written in their logbooks every day saying that this storm that seemingly didn't exist was on them for three days and then disappeared. So kind of like in the movie The Lighthouse, it seemed like they were just going insane. I feel like this is something that happens to people that are in a cramped area for a certain amount of time. If you think about it, it was this was in like December. This was a really cold time. I'm sure they were indoors all the time. And maybe that's what just drove them to go insane. Other people think that they were being judged, like I said before. And other people say that this was like a supernatural monster that was inflicting torment upon them. This Flannan Islands area is just completely riddled with stories about sea monsters and, you know, the Loch Ness Monster is close to there. Lots of stories about sirens and mermaids. There's even like this siren story from that area that says that it'll like read rhymes to you and if you fail they'll eat you. It's just an all around strange place. So did the Kraken get them? Probably. Anyways, let's move on to the last one and that is where do eels come from? So I'm talking specifically about European eels. This is just really weird. People don't know where European eels come from. So while scientists have kind of figured out where some eels come from, they have not figured out where these European eels come from at all. People have been puzzled where eels developed for centuries, like Aristotle and Sigmund Freud, uh, but why? They have no idea how they reproduce. And modern scientists still questions where they really come from. The reason why they had such a hard time figuring out where eels come from is just because they couldn't find any male reproductive organs. People in the past came up with different theories like 
Aristotle concluded that eels emerged spontaneously from mud and rainwater, while others theorized that they began their lives as beetles, and some believed that eels were born from sea foam and were created when the rays of sun fell on different kinds of dew that covered lake shores and riverbeds in the springtime. Some also think that they were born when their hairs from horses fell into the water. That was like an ancient story. Sigmund Freud actually tried to crack the mystery. He spent months in Italy in the town of Triste. There he got eels from fishermen and dissected them, searching for the male's reproductive organs. Some think that he dissected as many as 400 and still didn't find anything until he eventually gave up. About 10 years later in 1886, a French zoologist watched a leptocephalus morph into a eel inside of a tank in his office. This discovery proved that these eels were metamorphic and that they go through six distinct stages throughout their life. So it turns out that eels only grow reproductive organs at the last stage of their life cycle, which is when they leave the freshwater environments and travel thousands of miles to the Sargasso Sea. The crazy thing is, no one has ever seen European eels mate in the Sargasso Sea. And no one has even seen adult European eels there at all. So the only reason that they believe that they're there is because the first stage of the eels, whenever they're before the metamorphosis, are found there in the Sargasso Sea. Which is so strange. So where are they going? Are they going super deep? Are they spawning from volcanoes down there? I mean, nobody knows. They're probably spawned from mud and rainwater, if we're all being honest. And that is the end of the entire Ocean Mystery Iceberg. If you've watched to the end, you're a psychopath. Thank you for watching. There's probably like an hour of this video, so you're probably a pretty cool guy or girl. Um... <clears throat> yeah, what what about what about that island Bermeja? Pretty crazy, right? You probably think that the Kraken exists now, huh? But from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for all the support on all these videos. I can't believe so many people watch them. It's kind of mind blowing. But if you have an idea for another series that you'd like to see me do, you can just drop it in the comments. I'll probably be reading your comment. I will be reading your comment. I'll be reading all of them. Unless this gets like 2 million views, but I, I don't think it will. But yeah, the ocean's really mysterious. If you don't think the Kraken's real, then you're wrong at this point. Uh, thank you. Uh, goodbye.